Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And we are live tonight. This is December the 27th in the year 2013. We just got back from a long trip in Asia and Australia. We've been gone for six weeks. So I know you've been listening to archive shows while I'm gone. But tonight we're live, so if anyone wants to call in, you can do it. We're going to mostly fill you in on the things that happened during the trip. I'd like to first wish everyone a Merry Christmas. I'm glad you're joining us tonight. We got back just in time. We didn't know if we were going to get back in time or not, but we just made it in time for Christmas. When I think now we're over jet lag. It took us, I think it took me a little longer this time. Usually it takes a couple of days. It was about three days to get over it. But while we were gone, they had lots of snow, and I kept saying, it'll be melted by the time we get back, and it was. It was. <laughs> but now we're back, and Christmas is is over, and we're headed toward New Year's. <clears throat> so it's hard to believe the whole year has gone so fast. Right. I was just looking at this, and where it says you started the show October 2005, and I remember that, I know that. But to see it written there like that and go, and this is 2013, you've been doing the show for eight years now. Yeah. And that's just like, I remember when you started doing it. <laughs> I know. Whenever Don was having all the problems with the uh, the broadcasting and the networks and his equipment failing, and we had, um, he moved out to California, so there was a lot going on in those days. Right. Now it's a lot more stable. We just have gremlins every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, that's eight years now we've been doing this show. <clears throat> that seem weird? It does. It, it's really flown by. But wow, <laughs> we've done all. I think I had on here. We're on our two hundredth and something a live show. Okay. We have all the other ones that are archived. So it's actually eight years of it. But a lot of those were not uh, live. Mm-hmm. But counting the live shows, yeah, we're on the 220th live show. So we had a big supply of archives there that they've right. been drawing from all these years. <laughs> huh. That's a lot of talking. Yes, but you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a lot of wonderful guests, too, along right. the way. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, now another week here we're going to be, I guess we come on next week, we'll be already be in 2014. That's right. Wow. <laughs> And the time just goes so fast. Let me go ahead and give out the toll-free number. Anyone who wants to call in tonight is welcome to do it. 1-888-627-6008. 1-888-627-6008. Yeah, and we, I remember and always had a lot of call-ins, too that people were trying to get in in those early days, and now we're all over the world. Don has done terrific with this show. Right. It's his dream. He's followed through on it. Mm-hmm. You're always telling people, if you've got a dream, follow it. Otherwise, you'll regret it later. Right. And dreams are not easy. We know that. <laughs> that to do it, you have to believe in it, and it's not easy. But if you don't, you'll you'll regret it the rest of your life. Right. Okay. Well, we just got back from this trip, and we're going to talk about that. If anybody wants to call in, they're free to do it. But um, we've been gone six weeks. We left two around. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we've been, during Christmas, we had a house full of kids and relatives and all our, our family. we got a big family. We didn't even have half of them here. And we were trying to tell them what was going on. And I couldn't even remember what country we were in when we were telling the story. Well, because we've had so many events back to back. And so that's where, I mean, we had, we went to Mexico and did a class. And I think we've talked about that. Then we had a class here. And then immediately after, we left, went, went on, to the cruise. The cruise had a class on the cruise. These things are just been one right. after the and other. Then I think, I don't think it was even a week or about a week. And then we went on this trip. So it's just been everything back to back. It's hard to remember where we were and what we were doing. This trip would have been longer, and we would have only had a day or two between. 
Originally, we were supposed to go to Istanbul to a UFO conference they were having there, and then that was canceled. So it gave us a week anyway to get ready for this long six-week one. Well, we went first to Beijing, and we were there for two weeks. And, well, last year we were in China three times, so we're getting used to China. But, um, uh, yeah, I like the people. The people are wonderful oh, there. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. Everywhere we go, we don't have any problems at all. Right. It's just getting used to the food. And China is a different kind of food, but we survive. Well, we weren't <laughs> eating their food except in one place I did. But <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to talk about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. But... Yeah, they were trying their best they could in the place we were staying for the classes to give us Americanized Chinese food. Right. It was their, what they thought American food was. But it was okay. We could eat it. It was fine. Yeah. Oh, that was great. But we had a level two class and a level one in Beijing. And the level one was 100 students. And I am so proud of these Chinese students that are taking the class. The level two, when they've taken that, they're getting it. They're really understanding it, and they're having miracles happen. So it's showing it's happening all over the world, everywhere they're taking the class. It's wonderful things are are happening because they're understanding it. But now that we're doing the level two in a different way, we're turning out more powerful practitioners, too. Right. Because we're doing a more uh, one-on-one individual training. But we had 100 students in the level one, and um, they were really understanding it. You never know when you got a translator. <laughs> you know, exactly I'm surprised. It's like, well, they yeah. understood it like all the other translated classes we had. <laughs> but, you know, we always hope it's coming across with translation. Well, we have a wonderful young man in China. He's been there last year three times and on the cruise with us to the Mediterranean. And this year, he's a wonderful translator. I mean, we couldn't do anything without him. Right. But I always wonder when they're doing it, are we really getting translation? <laughs> a lot of things can be lost. Well, especially, that's why I try not to use any slang or uh, expressions that they are not, they're going to be lost in translation. But uh, one thing I want to say about everywhere we went We went to China. We're going to talk about each place, Beijing and Taiwan and Tokyo. But everywhere we went, they are really into Christmas over there. I was really surprised. Well, they had the decorations up. What what I was told, it was because of the the commercialism and shopping, just like it is here. (laughs) But, But I was surprised they're really into it that much. They had more decorations than Australia did. (laughs) But they have big Christmas trees everywhere you go and a lot of lights on the streets and in the stores. It's really decorated up. And that's why I told them I was surprised because they're mostly Buddhists over there. Uh, They would be celebrating Christmas. Well, they're not into the religious part at all. Right. They're into Santa Claus. Exactly. (laughs) Santa Claus and the presents. And there were Santas everywhere. (laughs) So that's really caught on all over the world. But uh, people out there buying presents, just like we do, you wouldn't have thought you were anywhere else but the United States. And they're, they really got into Christmas. In November we went over there was before uh, Thanksgiving. Of course, they don't celebrate that. But we were they were into the Christmas things. And I thought it was wonderful the way that everything was lit up. They said we just missed it. Uh, they've been having a lot of trouble with real heavy smog in Beijing. And a lot of it's caused by all the traffic. And the pictures I saw on the Internet just before we left, walking on the street, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Before we left. To go to uh, Beijing. Well, then there were reports after we left Beijing. It's the same thing? Yeah. But, so, see, we always, wherever we go, we have a bubble around us. So, <laughs> so we didn't have that because they, they were canceling flights because there was so much smog. But they was telling it is because of the traffic. And the traffic is really heavy in Beijing. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what they were telling us, though. 
You can't get a car that easy over there anymore. There are just too many oh, cars. That was very surprising how they do that. Too many cars. Well, yeah. too many people. Well, too many people and too many cars. And the cars was causing a lot of the smog. Right. And they said they love it when the wind blows because that blows the smog away. You tell them what they're doing, how they get a car over there. Well, they said it was like a lottery. They they just have their numbers in a in a like a lottery pull, and you're registered in there. And then when they pull your number, then you can go get a car. That's when you can get your license and can get a car. It's just it's purely a lottery ticket essentially. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not by choice. And until you get your ticket pulled, you're on public transportation, a bicycle or a motor scooter. Uh huh. And they have a lot of um, sure trains. Rides with other people. <laughs> uh, yeah. They have a lot of trains and buses mm-hmm. and things. But um, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you've got money to buy a car outright, you can't do it. Well, you might be able to do it, but you can't drive it until you get. <laughs> yeah. They pull your license. Yeah, you just buy a car and it's going to sit there. So that's one way, you know, I guess the way these countries do, I guess if we had came up with the same problem, we'd figure out a way to do it. Right, I mean, it's an answer. Yeah. It also shows us how privileged we are over here to be able to just go get a car and drive it whenever we want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and over there, we was there last year, they said, I wouldn't be allowed to drive. Mm-hmm. I think it was said if you get by 65 or 70 years old, you're not allowed to drive a car anymore. And they were surprised that I had my own car. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have to, to go through a lottery process. Right. <laughs> but that's the, the difference over there. You know, there's a lot of the older people, they won't let do anything. Well, then they all live together in those their own communal houses anyway. So that which I would never stand for. I've got too big a family. I don't want them all living yeah, with me. Yeah, but if you were raised in it, it'd be different. <laughs> and that's your way of life. <laughs> well, one thing while we were in Beijing, we were there when history was being made. That was really cool. Because, you know, uh, since the 1970s, I think is when they first, so they were saying it's been that long since they started the one child only uh, rule in uh, China. because. They were just, the population is just way out of control. So they had to do something to control it. And when I was there last year, I was talking on the radio about who who are we to uh, criticize other countries until we are faced with the same circumstance? How would we handle it? So the only answer they had was just to allow one child per family. Well, now we were over there. They're finding out it's got a lot of problems. Right. They didn't think it out far enough in the future. Yeah, they didn't think that, what, that'd be 40 years. Now, they haven't thought 35, 40 years. Right. I think they said they've gone two generations, about two generations, and it's really having an impact on on their socioeconomic system. <laughs> yeah, they. I guess when you come up with the idea, it sounds like a good idea, but you don't plan it that far in advance. So they're finding out, well, one thing... They don't have the workforce, especially for out in the country. The agricultural workforce, they don't have it with just having one child per family. Right. <clears throat> I mean, we don't think about it, but, I mean, these are all things that go into the whole... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Ecostructure? Right, or? right. The ecostructure, yeah, of the of society, you know, and how the whole thing plays out. You have your population... You know, they're working force, and then as they grow older, then they retire, then the younger working forces are paying into the the funds that take care of them, and it's just an ongoing thing. Each generation takes care of the one before or the two before or whatever, and that's where, you know, you don't think about it. I mean, we probably will have similar things because we have this one population that's aging. That's what they keep talking about. That baby boomer group is aging, and it's a very large group of people and there aren't as many coming up behind them to support. So these are very real situations. And you don't think about it until you're... I mean, they they were very frank on the news over there. The ones that I could... Uh, there was only one channel that I could understand. In English. Yeah. And that was that's what they kept talking about because this was happening right then. But they kept talking about we need the younger people to take care of the older people. <laughs> and we, It was just, this is what it is. This is how it is. We don't say that over here. We don't 
point blank put it out there like that. Because they said there's all these older people mm -hmm. that are still alive. You know, they're getting older. That were part of that when they started the one child only. Now the younger ones coming up. One person has to take care of all these other generations. I think they said it took eight. Remember on that one one show. I want to say they said it took like eight people to support uh, two elderly or one elderly or something like that. That's how the the force. But then because they they did that cut, there's only it's like they have now four people. Because you have two sets of parents when you get married, so four people are going on the shoulders of uh, a one person or a couple, and it's a lot of weight. <laughs> and so really that's and then they if they ever have children, also a lot of uh, money, a lot of concern that they had to deal with. Yeah, and that's what they said. They didn't thought about that. Who's going to take care of the older generation? Of course, they figured as they die out. But uh, there was a lot of things like that that weren't thought out. Right. But also was the workforce, because uh, all of a sudden they don't have enough people to manufacture, and also mostly out in the country where they have the agriculture and the growing, they don't have the people they used to have to do the agriculture work, the picking and taking care of the animals and growing things. Well, it's that as well as the tax base. Yeah, it's all of that because all that sports the elderly. Mm -hmm. So they don't have it falls a lot on the on the ones that are the young working force. But the ones in the country, there's not enough now to maintain. Have the growing of the food. You always got to think of that. The growing of the food to take care of the people. Yes. All of that. So it was interesting that we hadn't thought about that. But though they said this was groundbreaking, it was history making while we were there. They've decided to allow the people to have another child. Yeah, there are other. It's not quite that blanket like it sounded at first. It's like there's some other regulations. Other regulations, but basically, in the gist of it, yes, they're going to allow them to have another child. So mm -hmm. they've got to manage it so they won't have the population explosion. They finally stabled out. Well, and that's what they were asking people. They were doing a thing, and they said, because I mean, their, their cities are huge. You know, 40 million people, 50, I mean, it was like, they're huge cities. And they said, okay, if now you can have another child, I mean, that can potentially double that city, you know. And, and that's what they were asking people, well, will you have another one? And it was about even. Some of them said, yes, they wanted to. And then others said, no, I can't afford to have another one. So they've already gotten accustomed to what it would take to raise one. Mm-hmm. On that pork, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they've taken them, what is 35, 40 years now to finally stabilize the population. They got it to where it's even, but then it's out of balance in so many other ways. Right. But, uh, uh, yeah, that was interesting. They said they were asking if you know, that the law is passed, will you mm -hmm. have a child? And a lot of them don't want to. Some of them don't even want to get married. So I guess it's balancing out in other ways. Right. And it could be because they're so open about it, then then people are able to make uh, conscientious choices, you know, and, and how they want to work with the future. Because mm -hmm. I think most part, otherwise it's just, well, they don't realize their part in the future yeah. that they play. I know we were talking to some of our students. We had a, a hundred students in our level one, the big class. And... They can't really comprehend that we have so many children. Right. That mm -hmm. was something that was difficult for them. Yeah, because we have big families over here. And they couldn't understand that people wanting to have a lot of children. Yeah, I think it's been driven to them, driven into them to not want children. So that that was another way of taking care of that. Yeah. And I said, well, over in a, up in America and Europe, other parts of the world, people like a lot of children. So we don't have that problem in America yet. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? No, but, I mean, we have dramatically decreased the number that we have. It's not by because people are forcing us to, but most people have automatically. You know, where it used to be it was normal to have four, five, six children. Now it's more like two, two to three, something mm -hmm. like that. And that's not over the, across the board, but you're seeing it. It did just naturally did it because they kept pushing only replace yourself, only yeah. replace yourself. So 
Hmm. Yeah, and Europe is doing the same thing. We found when we go to Europe, a lot of them don't want to get married, and they don't want families. They'd rather be in the business force. But now, India is another problem. We go there, they're out of control. But I don't know what they're going to do about that. It's up to the people. You know? mm, that country. Yeah, each country, what they decide. But we travel so much, we get to see all of this firsthand. And it's interesting to see how each country handles these things. Everywhere we go, I always want to know, what about the elderly? You know, how do you take care of them? What do you do? And how do you manage all of this? Some of the countries do a better job than we do. Absolutely. On Not this, but other things that they do. Mm-hmm. So we could learn a lot from some of these countries. Well, that's just it. We learn a lot from each other all, all over the place. So. Mm-hmm. That's why people are people everywhere we go. We don't have any problem with people. A lot of us say, how can you travel all this so much? Aren't you afraid? And no, we've never been afraid. Never been afraid. No, no the traveling is hard, but we've never been afraid. Of the people. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, the long trips, the long uh, hours on the plane is the hard part. Mm-hmm. And we went to Beijing. We did the new route that we took the one time last year. You go, you go over the pole now. It cut about three hours off the flight. So we didn't see Santa Claus, but we didn't <laughs> see his house, but we flew over the pole. I saw it. I saw, the, I saw the the workshop with the elves. <laughs> you he did? He wasn't out. He was... He was resting, I guess. <laughs> well, you were on the other side of the plane. Yeah, you saw things I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we were in Beijing, and I was there for two weeks. And I just got to say this. My assistant went with us, and it was a big culture shock. He'd never been anywhere like this. But her culture shock was they didn't have any coffee. Well, and that's a big deal if you're a major coffee drinker. I'm sure we have lots of major coffee drinkers out there. Yeah. And they will totally understand. No coffee in Beijing. They like tea. Well, it's just like in England. Well, they had coffee, but it was not like American coffee at all. Not the way we are right. addicted to it over here. So that was a culture shock for her. <laughs> Things like that. And also, no a Facebook and no um, YouTube. Right, in China. No. In China. But they was t- The translator said they really don't want people to know what's going on in the outside world. But they they know anyway. Yeah. Just like everybody, they figure out ways to find out. So. There's ways mm-hmm. to get around all of that. Mm-hmm. But uh, so we have a lot of things here we, should, we, we don't even appreciate that like that. Although I don't even go on Facebook and those things. A lot of people, that's their whole life. Right. Well, and it was it is hers. I mean, she, that's how she stays in touch with everybody, and that's how she planned to stay in touch with everybody back home. Because this was a major trip for her. First time it, 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 that extensive and that far away. So this was one of the things that she knew she could hold on to to be able to see her family. And then it wasn't there. <laughs> so yeah, and the, that was what a big deal. <laughs> What do you mean, no coffee and no Facebook? Right, that was a lot of <coughs> Big, uh, withdrawal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she was having withdrawal symptoms. Uh-huh. Okay. <clears throat> but you've got to tell them about your trip to the Great Wall. Uh-huh. Now, every time we've gone to Beijing, I always wanted to go to the Great Wall, but, you know, we've, we've never got out there. And the last trip, you said you've got to go. You said you had to go because... Why come that far and not get to see it? It's one of the major wonders well, of the world. Well, it's right there. I mean, it'd be different if it was across the country, but it's right there where we were. So. Outside Beijing. Yes. I didn't want to go because I'm not really into all that walking anymore like that. Now, Julia, you know, she went up and down the pyramids and down inside the pyramids. She can do that. I don't really want to do it. But so her and, and my assistant, Mavis, went out to the Great Wall. Right. So tell them what that was like to see that. Oh, it's amazing. It's it's unbelievable, actually, because you see it for quite a ways. You're a ways out. And you, you drove. You we need. drove. It was about an hour and a half outside of Beijing. And we're driving. You're going up into mountains and everything. And all of a sudden, I look, I was like, what is that? You can see something way over on this mountain. 
And it's just, it's that, you know, it's very, you can see it. <laughs> it was way off still. I thought, is that what I think it is? I said, oh, yeah, that's a great wall. <laughs> I'm like, nothing. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you like, oh. <laughs> So we're snapping pictures from a long ways away. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think we were still, I don't know, a good half hour, 45 minutes. I mean, you can see it from that far away. And then as you get closer, you can't see it because it's on the top of that mountain. Um, we stopped. Uh, to get some lunch before it. I mean, you, it, it's way up there because it, it's on the top of the mountain, <laughs> and that was what's amazing. Because it's so long, you know, that you could never go the whole length because it goes the whole border. Well, that that could be somebody's challenge, you know, to say I'm to walk the whole thing. But that that'd be could. miles and miles and miles and miles. Yeah. People do marathons. People do, <laughs> you know, that could be. I imagine there's people that have done that. Have Probably the have. Wall. That would be quite separate an China from Mongolia. Mm-hmm. But tell them what it looked, what happened when you you went. Tell them about the lunch first. No, oh, I can. Yeah, yeah. Our first thing was to get lunch, and um, we, it was at a little restaurant at the foot of the the mountain um, where you go up there and everything. And um, this is supposed to be a, a famous. They said it was a famous fish restaurant. I don't. I have no idea. But it's one of these where you pick your fish out. They're they're swimming out there in this little channel in front of the restaurant, and you just pick it, and I said, I'm not real comfortable with naming my food before I eat it, you know, I mean, it's like, I just, I, I, somebody else, is, man, uh, Kevin and Leo took us out there, they're, Leo is a translator, and Kevin uh, was one of the students in level two class, and so they took us out so we can, uh, you know, to uh-huh. be our tour guide. You don't guide. want to personally know your food you're No, I'd eat. rather not, I'd rather not, it's getting harder and harder anyway, I think that's something that's shifting in me, um, is you know, I don't eat that much beef or any of those things. I eat mostly chicken and fish. And now, sometimes when I'm eating them, I'll see their faces. And it's like, oh, man. <laughs> you know? And that's kind of like I think it's trying to shift me to, to let them be and not, not eat them anymore because I really yeah. don't want to see their faces. And well, then now, some countries, they, they have the whole fish with the face I know, on. and that's that's hard. That's why I don't want to have the face and on the there. the shrimp with the face. Yes, I don't like that. I don't want to see the face. I don't want to see the head. <laughs> and then sometimes, it, I mean, I'm something where the head's not associated with it all, and I'm seeing the face of the animal. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. And so then, you know, so I went out, and I thanked the fish before we ever, when I found out that we were going to be, eating one of them, and so I thank them ahead of time, and, you know, so I, I do that anyway. I thank my food, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I thank the animal or whatever it is that gave its life for me, but um, anyway, so I did that. We go into the restaurant, quickly found out it's not, I don't think it's a, it may be a famous restaurant. I don't know how they do things over there, but it was a very local restaurant. It was all the locals from right there that worked there were coming in because there were a lot of people coming in on their lunch hour, and and all these things, and uh, our first clue that there was not going to be a whole lot of catering was there were no Western utensils. It was all chopsticks. Uh-huh. Every place else we've been, there's usually an option to yeah. get something like that. So it's like, okay. But you were outside of Beijing. We were outside of Beijing, yeah, but, but I thought this was, you know, but this is a very major tourist site, too, but the part that we went to was not the one that most of the people go to. We were going to this other one. So I think it's more the local entrance. Okay. So we go in there and Leo, uh, he says, I'm going to order Chinese dishes so you can have the Chinese experience. And uh, But then he first said, okay, what, you know, you want some chicken? That's fine. That's always a standard. Let's have some chicken. We knew we were going to have that one of those fish out there. And um, then we we're going to have some chicken. And we said, okay, chicken and beans. And it's like, okay. And then he ordered some other traditional Chinese dishes. We had rice and we saw some potatoes that somebody had on another plate. It was like like shredded potatoes, kind of cash brown. And we anyway, little pieces. That's how they do their meals over there. It's a lot of little dishes. They put it on this great big lazy susan type thing, and then everybody shares. You know, you just it just keeps passing around, and you just pick out what you want and you eat. Well, and then they, but the other thing that's weird over there is different. I'm going to say it's weird, but it's different. Is they don't. I mean, you know how America, do you bring everything out when the whole thing is ready for everybody at the table? They bring it all out at once. Well, there, they bring out the dishes as they are done, and then you've got these things coming willy-nilly all over the place, and so you just start eating, <laughs> and you don't know when the next piece is coming, and you just, 
and they just keep doing that. It's like you're snacking and, and the whole time. Anyway, so the first thing that came out was this chicken in a bowl, and it's just a little medium-sized bowl, and it's got chicken in it. And so I picked a piece out of there. It wasn't really a pan. I just picked, like, I don't know, maybe a, a drumstick or something. It, it's some little piece. Maybe it was a piece of a wing. I don't know. And tasted that, and then some rice came out, just pieces. And then that chicken made its way around, and it came back around. I'm looking at the bowl, and I thought, that's not what it, I think it is, is it? And Leah's like, what, what, what? And I'm like, is that? Is that, what is that on the top? And on the top of this bowl was this chicken foot just sitting there on the top of the bowl. I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's just got its claws. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> well, they told us last year they don't waste anything. I know, but I, I wasn't, because I'd had a conversation before we ever left that day with someone else. And I said, well, as long as they don't have all the pieces and parts of chickens, I'll be fine. All the feet and the heads, and I'll be fine. And so I said, oh, no, they, they, this is a nice restaurant. They won't be doing that. <laughs> so anyway, here's his foot. And I thought, oh, my goodness. So uh, Mavis takes it out, and she's taking pictures of it and and stuff. And uh, so she's like, okay, I'm not having any chicken. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, it makes its way around and uh, another time. And when it comes back, well, I made a comment to Leo, and I said, now, there's not going to be a head under here, is there? <laughs> oh, no, 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 there won't be one. Because it was a little bowl. <laughs> it wasn't very big. Now, uh, nah, there's no way a head's going to be in there. And it comes back around, and I'm like, oh, no, Leo, <laughs> don't, just please don't tell me that's what it looks like. And it was the, what the, is comb. That, the comb on the top of the chicken's head. I could see that. So, And sure enough, it was. And Mavis dug it out. There was the chicken's head. <laughs> I was like, oh no! I mean, I really don't want to see the animal's faces. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, well, we're not criticizing. It's just no. that you know, Americans to it. Not Americans to it. don't eat. Other countries they do eat everything, but we're Absolutely. not. Absolutely no, it. and it's fine. It's nothing against it. It's just I wasn't prepared. prepared for it. I'm not used to it, and I wasn't prepared for it. So it. Mm-hmm. And like I said, that's been something that's been happening to me anyway, where I don't want to see the faces. And that's really something I'm not used to seeing a face of on the my food. The chicken in know? the bowl. Right. And chicken it was just, in. <laughs> it was... And Mavis took a picture of <laughs> yeah. that, too. Right. She took a picture of it, and then um, she was going to send those pictures back home to her family when they were having Thanksgiving dinner. She was going to just do a little joke with them. but. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> But anyway, then tell about how you got up to the Great Wall. Yeah, that was that was a great <laughs> climb. Um, so after this, because we needed that, I'm glad we did this because we needed the strength. <laughs> <laughs> so you get there, you, we parked, and then you walk up this steep hill just to get to the cable cars that go up the steep mountain, that get to the the platform that... This where you take the steps that go up, <laughs> up the wall. It's very steep. Very I'm steep. I'm glad I could not have done it. <laughs> right. I mean, all the, on, on that first walking up there are all these shops, there are all these little booths, these vendors selling, selling their wares. But it's really steep, just that street. And that's before you get the cable cars, and then it's like climbing the mountain and the cable cars. Um, but yeah, that was that was a lot just right there. Everything was climbing. Climbing, climbing, climbing. Finally get up to, they have like this, where the cable cars come in. And then you go up some stairs on the side, and then you actually get into, on the wall. Because you're going up the side, and then it goes into these little, um, what do you call them? Oh, it's a place for the sentries. The sentries, yes. Yeah, so like, almost like little forts. Little <laughs> buildings. <laughs> right. Well, they're little, little, uh, little houses up right. there, stone houses right. where the sentries would be. Right. And so it went into there, and then you could go one way or the other. It had steps going down each side. But the thing that was so amazing to me, I mean, it's wide. It's probably at least 10 feet wide, the whole thing. And it goes, but the, but what was so weird was, or amazing, was this thing just follows the mountain. It's, on, it's right on the top of the mountain, and it's following it exactly. It's not, they didn't pay that away. They didn't, you know, bulldoze anything out to make it flat. <laughs> In fact, it's going up and down. It's very steep. It's going up and down the mountain peaks and everything, you know, following the mountain. Hmm. And uh, it's just amazing what went into doing this. Um, just going out of one of the sentries, you know, to walk down the next part and go across, it's just really, really steep. 
And you said even the steps are not even. Oh, no, not at all. There's nothing even. They were just making things work, you know. I mean, it's amazing what is there. <laughs> it's amazing. And in one of the centuries, they had it all lined with paper, and people were writing their names and things on that. So we did get our names put in there. So that was, <laughs> that was cool. So I'm in the Great Wall. <laughs> <laughs> like we were in Ephesus. They were making mm-hmm. little notes yeah, and the putting them in the wall. Prayer wall, yeah. Uh-huh. But... Uh, but it's a lot taller and bigger than it looks like in the pictures. Then um, the wall was well, like a fortress because it's got the the cutouts, like if it were a, like if you were up there with guns and things like that. What well, you it wasn't guns, just bows and arrows. And Whatever they had were weapons, you know. So they had the cutouts. It's that kind of a wall, just like you would see on a palace or something. Both sides are that way, and then it had these little sentries every so often, and. Uh, and they had all these levels to them where they probably sat up there and did all, you know, where they could observe and mm. see things. Um, but it's, but yeah, the the height of it was probably, it was taller. The walls were taller than me, but where the cutout was, like you, you could just bend over and see. Mm. So it's just about the, the height of me. And they said they built that, you know, it was centuries ago, but they built it to keep the Mongolians out, to keep the enemy out. But after they got it all built, they said it didn't do any good. They just climbed over the wall anyway. Yeah, if they can climb that mountain up to there, they can climb that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're that good of a climber, you can, you can you do it. you said they had a sign that said they built it to keep the enemy. Oh, that was cool. I need, to, I need to, I took a picture of that sign. I need to post it. They said it was built to keep the enemy out, and it was all this bloodshed and everything to keep the enemy out. But now... Uh, the gist of it now it's so beautiful because because of it it pulls the world together because they all come to see it so in that way it, it has united the world uh-huh hmm. but that's good that's mm-hmm. interesting hmm. yeah. so that was an interesting day very yeah it was that's that's one of those once in a lifetime things you know that's what i'm trying to do now i mean i guess that's one we kept saying that's a bucket list item you know that's something you want if you can do it and you have the opportunity to do it, not very many people have can say they've walked the Great Wall of China. You know? Well, it's like you <laughs> in the pyramids. Right. And then only a few weeks ago we were in the Panama Canal. Right. These are all things that we like to check off mm-hmm. that we get to do with this wonderful work we're involved right. with. Right, absolutely. Okay. But I do want to make a remark. Um, in my China class, before we left, we were getting our... Uh, you know, getting ready for the class and everything. We got an email from a man in Mongolia. And I said, Mongolia? To me, that's the ends of the earth. And here we're getting an email from somebody in Mongolia. And he said uh, he worked is at a cancer hospital in Mongolia. I can't pronounce the name of the capital. But he said he want, wanted me to, to learn the technique. And he had some others there that wanted to learn, and they wanted to know, could we come to Mongolia to teach on that trip? And that's what I mean to me. That's like somebody on the end of the earth asking you to come. I'm amazed. I said, how did you find out about me Internet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he could get YouTube. <laughs> yeah, he so. could get YouTube. He found out about me. I said, mm-hmm. in Mongolia? But I told them there was no way we could come that far for just a small group of people. So he had two choices. He could either come to Beijing and take the class there or take the online class. So he agreed to come to Beijing. He was a wonderful man. Very sweet. sweet. And uh, he very much devoted, you know, he really wants to work with the cancer and help the people. And um, he couldn't speak Chinese. (laughs) But his English was good enough that I, apparently he followed me with English the class. But he was really dedicated. He really wanted to learn this technique and take it back to Mongolia. But I said, now I think we are reaching all the corners of the earth when right. you got something like that. As we know, when we did the Russian class, we had some people from Siberia that came. But I said, Mongolia, I would never expect it to meet somebody from there. <laughs> so, but, well, the, but you're still thinking of them the way you probably were taught about them in your childhood, and that's not them at all. That's what he was telling us. He said they're no longer 
riding around on horses with the big fur hats and all of that, and the yaks. Uh, so our impression of most of the world is not the way it really is. So when you go to these countries, you find out it's really more modernized everywhere than than we could have ever imagined. Mm. So We haven't seen too many places that aren't modern, but I, I know that there are places like that, but we just we haven't gone there yet. Yes. Yeah. They're not really in in our, well, I think they would ask us to come, right. really. But it shows most of the world, those are just stories of people that, what you think things are supposed to be like, and they're not like that anymore at all. We're all very modern everywhere. But anyway, that was interesting. But then we went to Taiwan. We were there last year and giving a lecture, and they wanted us to come back and do a class. And that's a different, it's, it's a, t- a <laughs> culture shock in its own. Well, that's that's more, that's so much like America. Yeah, I said, when you go to Taiwan, it's like East meets West. So much of American influence is in there that you don't even think you're out of America. Well, I mean, they even take our, our electric plug. Their outlet fits our, I mean, our electricity. It's all the same. So that tells you something right there. If our plug fits their outlet, <laughs> we have a lot of American influence there. Mm-hmm. But everywhere you go, I mean, there's all the stores and the little, yeah, it's all you place. know, Seven Eleven, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, everywhere, and you swear you were in America. Right. Also, motorcycles have taken over. Well, they're motor scooters. You keep calling them motorcycles. They're motor scooters. You don't think they're as big as a motorcycle? No, no. There might have been a couple like that, but most, for the most part, they're called scooters. Okay. But um, there again, it's a traffic jam like it was in Beijing. There's so much traffic. In order to get around that, they have these scooters. But everybody rides them. Well, and it's probably because they're so inexpensive, too, and they're easy to park. (laughs) They have lack of parking spaces. (laughs) All along the sidewalks in front of every shopping place there was, there was all these lines and lines of scooters. And everywhere in, they were ducking in and out of traffic, too. So it was, uh, it's the most we saw anywhere. And it, that was worse parking, worse uh, traffic than in London, I think. No, no, no. London's bad. <laughs> but Beijing was a lot of cars, but here it was cars and mostly scooters. But Taiwan, uh, we like that. We've been there before. And it's very modern. Right. It's easy to figure it out. I mean, we, we kept going out and walking around, so it was we had that section of town. Where we were. A few blocks that we were. We had but that then Taiwan out. is not very big anyway. It's an island. But then we went to Tokyo. Now, Tokyo, to me, was different. Very modern. Mm-hmm. But um, I felt a kind of a dark feeling there. I didn't have any problem. <laughs> I... I immediately was getting London references to it. It felt like London to me, and I kept thinking, why on earth does Tokyo feel like London? Because the shops didn't. and the way no, the no, street? it was just no. I think immediately it was because the way they drive, they drive on the you know they drive the same way as in England, and uh, so I, that was my first thing. But then there was something I don't I know that I can even remember what it was. The way the streets were laid out, or something. Something, and the way the the little it's the way the village, the way the city was done, and I, and it was just, and the way the stores were, and I thought this, it reminded me of London, and so I asked, I said, why do I keep feeling like I'm being reminded of London? And they finally said, well, after the war, the British came in, and they had a huge influence on rebuilding the city. Yeah, because you you got to remember World War Two, we bombed Tokyo to pieces. And then we came in and occupied it for many years, and we had the allies. One of them was England and France, and they were in there helping to occupy it. So I imagine they had a big part to play in how to rebuild it. Apparently they had a very big part to play. In the streets and everything. But it's a very modern city. Uh, interesting, you know, they the earthquake, was it been two years ago, that destroyed the um, nuclear plant on the North Island. And they said that uh, it'll never be rebuilt. It is the radiation is too high, 
and it's really bad, and they evacuated the people out around that because they never go back. The radiation is too high. And that they can't use it for electrical power anymore. That's been destroyed. Well, so, actually, while we were there, that was something else that was happening. While we were there, they were going in to take the rods out. They were dismantling that plant. They're trying to get it. They were taking the rods out. But I said, well, what are you using for electricity? And it shows that... We don't really need the nuclear. They have ways of doing this. These scientists get their heads together. And they said, we figured out other ways to get electricity. And one thing they're doing is with the tides. Because they said Japan is primarily an island, a group of islands. And they have the ocean on both sides. So when the tide comes in and out, somehow they're able to harness that power to create electricity. And they've also, by walking on the sidewalks, are generating electricity. I read an article one time that said this was possible, but apparently they followed through on it. So they have enough people. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tokyo is another huge city. Everywhere we went, the big cities. And, you know, it makes me appreciate this place in the country here where we don't have anybody. Right. Well, especially there, they had no, it was so little, and I'm not going to say no because we did find some trees, but they had so little greenery, so few trees. Um, it, it's just, that was just bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> what trees they did have on the streets were like pitiful excuses for trees. Well, that was that one part where we were driving. There was a part, there was a park over there. I don't want to give the impression that this not parks there, but like uh, no but there was a park there yeah. was a park that had a lot of trees in it but mm, not like other cities we've been to yeah they were mostly just like trunks with where all the limbs had been cut off there was no greenery well you know that's where singapore learned a lesson they have these beautiful parks there they don't have any smog because hong kong completely cut everything down mm -hmm. to make a bigger more room to build houses mm -hmm. But uh, if these cities are huge with the I'm people. I can't remember if it was Tokyo or not, but we were seeing trees on top of buildings. <laughs> so, it may have been there. Yeah, it's like people were trying to get trees in there, Some trying to get greenery. greenery. Mm -hmm. But um, we had a good experience in Tokyo, too. We went to this one temple, and it was on the edge of town out there, and that was beautiful, the Statue of the Buddha. And they shopping, they had all the, the Japanese market. Yeah. market. Mm -hmm. We got to see some things there. But when we took off from Tokyo, Julia said this was very interesting to her. She was looking down on Tokyo. Well, from not, not make it sound like that. I was on the airplane looking at it from the airplane. Well, I didn't mean it that <laughs> right. way. We were in the airplane, and she was looking down on Tokyo. She was on that mm -hmm. side of the plane. And it was, a, it was just an incredible, I've not ever seen a city, it looked different from any city I've seen from the airplane. And it just kept going. Oh, my goodness. As far as you could see, it was just concrete. It was buildings. And I, I, I just kept looking both ways. It was as far as you could see. Usually you see the end of your town, of the city, and it just kept going and going and going. And it was just concrete, concrete, concrete. Uh and it, it was different because usually you'll see like the center part. You'll see the city, and then it kind of starts meandering out. And the downtown part, right? And the but it wasn't like first. that. It was like it just, it just kept going. <laughs> it's hard to describe. But then I could finally see as we kept flying, I could see that it ended at the foot of these mountains. I was like, okay, well there, that's that's the end. And it probably wasn't all Tokyo. It was probably all these suburbs that came together or whatever. These, but sections. it was huge. But it was absolutely huge. But then I could see, okay, it's going to end at these mountains. So there was an end to it. <laughs> and then we're starting to fly over the mountains. Okay, now there's nobody there. I thought, well, that's just amazing. You know, I start seeing a house here or a house there. It'd be very sparse. And I thought, I wonder what they, how they feel. You know, you kind of put yourself in, what do these people do? What do they think? I wonder how often they go to Tokyo, to the city, <laughs> you know, things like that. So I'm just observing all of that. And then I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw another mountain over here that had snow on it. And I thought, oh, my goodness, because when we were coming into Tokyo, we kept seeing Mount Fuji over here in the distance, and we and we were wondering, is it something we could see? And they said, no, it's, it's a ways out of the city. Well, sure enough, as we're flying over there, we ended up flying right over it, and so I got to get a really good picture of it. <laughs>
And it is an extinct volcano. That's why it has that shape to it. Very cool. Mm, so she definitely got mm-hmm. that. Oh, I do want to say, too, when we were doing going to the temple, rickshaws still exist in Japan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they're for tourists. They charge you to, if you want to get a, a rickshaw ride, that used to be that was the only way, mode of transportation before they got all these cars. Those are legitimate ones. I think in other places we've been, they've had them on bicycles with bicycles and with horses, but these are actually people doing these. these uh-huh. Had the little hats, the whole bit. Yeah. And in in Tokyo, there were bicycles. There weren't all those motor scooters. Right. But everywhere you go, there's people, 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 and, and all the traffic really shows you how crowded the world is getting to be. In certain places. They're they're all concentrated in these cities. Once you get out of the cities, then you have a lot of land with few people. So it's like, for some reason, they I, I think you have people that like cities. <laughs> well, they go where the jobs are, too, mm-hmm. where the money is. Well, you know, in London, they said... If they go out, they can't get the money they do in down in they're working right in London. Right. So anyway, that was interesting, and then we went from there to uh, Australia, and finally we're back to we can understand people, <laughs> hey, <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> At least it was English, but they have the accents. But we've been to Australia so much. I've been going over there for 20 years. But at least we were back where you could read the signs and you could understand the people. And this time we just went to Sydney. In the past, we've had classes in all the cities of Australia. Well, the major cities. The major cities along the rim. But um, this time we only went to Sydney because uh, we wanted to get home for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. That's- <laughs> That's all we do, yes. And um, so we had uh, two classes there, so we were there for two weeks. But uh, yeah, we are changing the way we're going to be doing the classes now. Because uh, these long trips, I mean, that was 13-hour flight back. I wanted to break it up by stopping in Honolulu or something, but they said, no, not at Christmas time. Everybody's going to Hawaii. So we had to do the 13-hour flight all the way back. So just getting where those long flights like that are just really taking a toll on me, and we've we've been doing it for too many years. And uh, the flight's not enjoyable. The trips, seeing the people and having the classes, I love that. And teaching and mingling with the people, that part is good. It's just getting there and getting back. Right. Uh, one speaker I knew, she said, I wish we could do like Star Trek. I was just thinking that if we could just beam up and get over there. Yeah, she great. said she had the same thing. I don't like the trip. So we could just beam me up, Scotty, and drop me down. Yeah, That'd be the best way. Bilocate, whatever. I, I, we're probably not too far from that. So. <laughs> uh-huh. That'd be the best way to do it. You wouldn't have to have that long flight. So I try to cut up the flights as much as we can to stop that. But anyway, we had a wonderful time there. And everywhere we go, Christmas. And there, it's the same way. We went down and... Oh, the fun thing there was, well, they didn't have many decorations. But because it's so warm, they said it's just really hard to get summer. into the, uh, the, and the, the feel spirit. of it, you know, the spirit of Christmas. But their commercials were so funny because they have all these Santa surfing and <laughs> things like that. Santa's because in bikinis. And <laughs> you got to remember, Australia is in the opposite hemisphere. So there it was summertime. Right. And it was beautiful. It was 80 in the 80s. Oh, gorgeous. It was so wonderful. The sunshine, everybody running around in, in short sleeves and shorts and that's what Mavis said. She said, I don't want to leave the summer. we yeah, got to go back to the winter. We could go back home to the winter. But it was uh, beautiful weather. And uh, Darling Harbor, they had these big Santa Clauses in the, in the out harbor. there in the harbor. And they had fireworks that shot off that oh, one night. Saturday night, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they're all in the spirit there. So we were, had the Christmas spirit. We just weren't home. But even in Japan, Taiwan, China, everywhere, Santa Clauses and Christmas trees and lights. And carols, Christmas carols, everything. But I have to say, we do it more here because as soon as we got to L.A., 
it was Christmas. I mean, the decor we we do it much more than than those countries. Maybe all the countries. I don't know. We overdo it because that's what they said in England. They they don't do the lights like we do. Yeah, but those are pretty. That's what's so pretty. They said this can was electricity. But that's what's so pretty. <laughs> that's the magical. Part. Yeah. So we yeah, when we left Sydney and got back to L.A. We stayed there for a couple of days. We couldn't get home right away. And, yeah, it was beautiful. That was Christmas. Mm -hmm. The hotel was just magical. Absolutely. See, that's the pretty part. All the lights (laughs) and all the... (laughs) I think we're coming down to time we're going to have to stop. But you can see this was quite a trip. And it was good to have Christmas in all those countries. Mm -hmm. Winter in Beijing and then summer in uh, Sydney. Right. <laughs> Come back here, it's winter, but at least the snow is melted. Right. Yeah. I, I would like to put some of the warmth in Australia, though. <laughs> yeah, and brought that with us. I think we've pretty well covered the whole trip. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll find something else to talk about then. <laughs> but you could, I'd like to let you in on our adventures and our travels. Even though it is, it's hard getting in and out. It's wonderful while we're there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I think it's time for us to sign off. So I want to thank everybody for listening, and I'm glad we're all back in the U.S. of A. And next time we talk to you, it'll be a new year. It sure will. So happy New Year, everybody! Make it great. It may be late to say Merry Christmas, but Merry Christmas, we'll Happy New Year. <laughs> Okay, good night, everybody, and thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.